So in this video, I'm going to go over everything you need to know from start to finish on how to do Lost Wax casting for yourself. And I'll also be going over all the tools and materials you'll need to get this started, along with where to get them. And by the end of this video, you should have all the knowledge to get consistent casts every time. So let's get started. To sum up Lost Wax casting as fast as I can, it's basically using a model that can be burnt away to leave a cavity inside of an investment or plaster so you can fill it with a metal and it will take the same shape. This is kind of similar to how sand casting works where you push something into the sand and it leaves an impression. Besides, this way you can make something with way more details and you don't have to remove the initial model, which allows you to do things that you would never be able to do doing sand casting. And me calling this Lost Wax casting is a little misleading seeing that you don't have to just use wax. And as an example, you can use dried organic materials, like this little pine cone. You can also use a 3D printer using PLA and use that as well, and get some pretty decent results. And there's even 3D printable resins on the market now that are meant for casting. And using this, you can get extremely high detailed parts. Well, that's enough explaining what this is, let's actually get into doing it. To start everything off, you're going to have to pick what material you're going to start with. For this video, I'm going to be using a castable resin. And to get my 3D model for printing, I'm going to scan this wax ring. And don't get me wrong, you don't have to 3D scan stuff. You can learn how to make 3D files on your computer using free software or paid. There's also a lot of pre-made stuff online that you can either get for free or you can pay a small fee for. And if the whole computer thing is not for you whatsoever, you can always learn how to do wax carving or even buy pre-made wax models. When it comes to castable resins, there's a lot of different options that come in at different price points. I'm going to be using Soriatech Cast. It's a well-rounded castable resin and probably the cheapest one on the market, seeing that you're normally looking at about $300 per kilogram. So for the learning purposes and showing you what HGPR1 can do for you, I'm going to use that. In the slicing software for my printer, I have supported all the models I'm going to be printing, which are coins and rings, and they're pretty much good to go and ready to start printing. And if you're curious about my print settings, here they are. And they might need to be adjusted for your particular printer, but at least you have somewhere to start. So these resins like to be printed warm, so I'm using a little mug warmer to warm this up to the proper temp. Honestly, Soriatech isn't too bad with the heat, but some of them are completely solid at room temperature. When it comes to the 3D printer I'm using, I'm using the Saturn II, which is an 8K resolution printer. But just about all of the resin printers on the market right now can use this resin. But anyways, after a few hours, everything is done. And with a scraper, I can just get this off of my build plate pretty easily. And with those off, you can see that the build plate is kind of stained purple, so it needs a really good cleaning whenever you use this resin. Along with that, all the parts are covered in uncured resin. So I'm going to wash some of that off before I remove all the supports. And this is 99% alcohol that I'm washing it off in. And anytime you're working with resin, make sure you're wearing gloves. So with the parts done, I'm going to blow off the residual alcohol with this little air gun. These things are really handy and rechargeable, so you don't have to buy canned air. And as you can see, even after washing this, there's still residual resin on here. So I'm going to have to remove the supports and then fully wash these. Using some clippers, I'm going to clip the base and separate these out into their own individual units. And to make it removing the supports a lot easier, just get some hot water, put it in a container, and drop your pieces into it for about 30 seconds. This is going to soften up your supports and make them just pop right off. And if we look at the back of the coin, it doesn't look great and it probably needs a little bit longer of an exposure time. But when it comes to the skull ring, it looks like the exposure times were perfect for this one. But I'm still going to need to fix some of the pock marks from the supports. And the coin is honestly still usable, just need to do a little bit of sanding work. And with all the supports removed, here's all the wasted material that you're going to have to account for when doing this. So just keep that in mind. But anyways, I need to properly clean this now. So I need three different cups, one with alcohol, one with hot water, and one with cold water. And I'll rinse it off in each one of them and then put it over to the side on a screen to dry. So this castable resin is a little finicky when it comes to the curing process. And it has to be submerged in vegetable glycerin. And the reason why you're doing this is when it's curing, you're trying to shed oxygen from the resin. And having it suspended in the glycerin will allow it to do this. And if you do it in just plain air, it won't allow the oxygen to go anywhere and it could also absorb more. And this could ruin the burnout process. But one of the problems with doing this is the resin will float. So you need to make something that will hold it down. And it also needs to be in a clear container that can let the UV light through. And you might notice that there are some pretty large bubbles in this that you probably don't want on here. So in the eye sockets, I'm going to just get those out with a piece of wire. And now I can put it into my UV curing station for about 10 minutes, and then I'll move the piece and do another 10 minutes. And if you don't have one of these, you can technically put this out in direct sunlight, and it should do the same thing. And with that done and everything cleared, you have to clean off the glycerin, which you're going to have to do with the same three cup setup, using the alcohol, hot water, and cold water. 
So with a lot of 3D printed parts, you have to clean them up a bit from all the supports. So I'm just going to use a rotary tool and kind of grind things down and smooth it out. And anytime you're grinding stuff down like this, make sure you grab some safety glasses so you don't get stuff in your eyes. And a mask or respirator would be really good since it's making a bunch of dust and you're breathing that in. And if you need to get into smaller areas or add details, I highly suggest getting a kit of burrs so you can do that. And that's all I really need to do for the skull ring. And when it comes to the coin, I'm just going to use some basic hand tools like this 220 grit piece of sandpaper with just a little bit of water on it to keep the dust down and keep it from getting clogged. After about a minute or so of sanding, it is as flat as I'm going to get it. I need to fill in a couple voids, but it looks pretty good. But before I do that, I need to clean up the sides a little bit more, so I'm going to use a hand file to do that. And you really want to do as much cleanup as you can right now, seeing that it's really easy to remove and add materials. Once you cast this to metal, it's a lot harder. So with that cleaned up to my liking, I need to fill in the voids. And one of the best ways to do this is to fill it in with a hard wax. But to use this wax, you need heat. One option is an alcohol lamp or kind of a candle, along with a metal wax carving tool. This way you can just heat it up and touch it to the wax and then transfer it onto your model. But my preferred method is the electric setup, because it has its own temperature controls and you can turn it on just by touching the side of the pin with your finger. It's just a lot more convenient to work with, but it's going to be up to you what you use. But anyways, once I have everything all filled in, I can sand it back down using some sandpaper or hand files, seeing that this is a harder wax. And there we go, the coin is pretty much good to go now. And when it comes to the skull ring, I just need to fill in some of the bottom edge and everything should be good to go. Now with everything cleaned up, I need to add a sprue to this. This is basically just a wax rod that all melts to the side of the ring. And this will act as something to attach to our main sprue and as a channel for the molten metal to flow into our mold once everything has been burnt out. And you want to make sure there's a clean and solid connection here because you don't want this to accidentally break off when it's in the liquid investment before everything hardens. And of course, I'm going to do the same thing to the coin. Just make sure you pick somewhere that you can file down and clean up later. Don't do this over a part that has details. And once I have those, I'll set up, I can attach them to the main sprue by melting both parts and sticking them together. Make sure to do them at a little bit of an angle like this though. Just like the connection to the model, make sure this is a strong joint as well. And try to get things as smooth as you can here so your molten metal has an easier path to go through. And if you're doing multiple models, you can attach them all to the same sprue, just make sure none of them are touching one another. So when it comes to the actual casting process, I'm going to be using a vacuum casting setup. But there's also a centrifugal force setup that you can use that comes in a little bit cheaper, but I've never used one so I don't know much about it. But they do work and I've seen great results from them. But anyways, when it comes to the vacuum casting setup, you have options when it comes to your different types of flasks. Like these solid ones, which are much cheaper, or these perforated ones that cost a bit more, but they get better vacuum through the entire mold, and in theory you can get a better cast. But regardless of whatever one you're using, you're going to use one of these rubber bottoms to hold your sprue, and so you can fill it with the investment. But before I do anything with that, I'm going to cut down some of the extra sprue on here, because we don't need it, and I need to take this over and weigh it, so we can figure out how much metal I actually need to cast all of this. And to figure that out, I just use this website. Just put in the 26.1 for the grams, make sure that it's set to wax, and go over to the metal I'm using, which is 925 silver. And then everything else you're not really needing, and calculate value. And there we go, it says I need about 270.4 grams of sterling silver to make this. So just using my scale, I just weigh out the amount I need. And with that done, I can put everything into my flask now, and I need to cover these holes, seeing that the liquid would just come right out of them. And to do that, you just need to use some tape. I prefer using the clear packing tape. And how I like to do this is start from the bottom, and and overlap layers going up and I do three layers on this size flask. And make sure you have a good amount over the top of this because if you don't it will overflow and make a huge mess. And here's everything you're going to need for mixing your investment. But before you do anything with the investment, make sure you have a respirator. Because breathing in the powder from this is extremely bad for your lungs. I also make sure to have my dogs out of the room so they don't breathe it in. So the investment is measured out by weight, and I use a scale to do this. And I just know from experience that I need 750 grams of plaster for this particular flask. You're going to want to use distilled water for this and something to measure it out with. It has milliliter reading. I'm going to need 40 milliliters for every 100 grams of investment. And the temperature of your water will change the work time of your investment. The colder your water, the longer you have, and the hotter it is, the quicker it'll set. Then you can add this measured water to your rubber mixing bowl and slowly add your investment on top of the water. Doing it this way will allow you to mix everything better and allow you not to have clumps at the bottom or dry spots. I'm going to be using an electric hand mixer to mix this just because it's faster, but you can do this just by hand. Just keep in mind that as soon as you add your investment to the water, you are on a time limit. And according to the data sheet for this investment, you have a total of eight minutes of working time and four minutes of that is just mixing it. 
and this entire mixing process is going to add a lot of air bubbles to this, so we need to vacuum it to remove as many of them as possible. And this is where my vacuum casting setup comes in really handy. Seeing that I could just turn this on, put my bowl under the dome, and start vacuuming out all the bubbles. It's going to look like your investment is boiling in here, and it's going to sit here for about a minute. And once that's done, you can pour it directly into your flask, and then this goes back into your vacuum dome for about two minutes. And this should get out all the remaining bubbles in your investment. And you can see right here why I add so much extra tape to my flask, because if I didn't, it would overflow everywhere and you would be losing a bunch of investment. So with that all done, you can remove the dome and clean up any mess you might have made, seeing that it might be easier for you to clean up when it's wet versus when it hardens. As you can see on mine, I had a small leak at the bottom, and just pushing my flask back into the rubber bottom should fix this problem. So now you need to let this set up and harden, but you don't want to move it while it's doing this, and it's going to take two to three hours. So move it now to somewhere that it won't be disturbed. So after about three hours, everything should be completely hardened. And now I need to remove the tape on the outside of this. You want to remove all this before you're putting it in the kiln, seeing that it's going to just burn off and make a bunch of fumes. And with that off, I'm going to scrape off any extra investment just using a flat scraper. And don't forget to remove the rubber bottom, seeing that this will not survive the high temps of the burnout process. I'm also going to scrape off that extra plaster from that small leak that I had. So it's finally time that I can put this in the kiln. And you might notice that this barely fits in here. This is a very small kiln that I'm using. And if you do get one of these, make sure to get something to put underneath it because the melted wax and resin tend to leak out of it. But anyways, let me get this thing powered on and have it start the burnout cycle that I programmed into it. This will ramp up the temperature and hold it at certain points for certain amounts of time. So I'm going to be using the standard burnout time for this investment, but it's also nice to see that they have one for resin as well. And I'm going to break down both of these burnout times for you so you can put them into your kiln without having to do all the math to figure it all out. I have a simple ventilation setup for this. Because you're going to be burning stuff off, it's going to put off smoke and fumes. But anyways, when I have about an hour left on my burnout cycle, I need to start melting down my metals. And I'm going to be using a furnace to do that. So all I need to do is load in my carbon crucible and pour in all the metal that I measured out for this. And then just close it up and set my target temperature. Which will be different for different metals you'll be using in this, so I'll have a data sheet in the description of the video. For the sterling silver I'm going to be using, I'm going to set this to 1020 degrees Celsius. Or about 1870 degrees Fahrenheit. So now with everything up to temp, I can now remove the flask from the kiln and put it into the vacuum casting machine. And when doing this, make sure that you have somewhere to put your flask down if needed. That won't catch on fire or burn, like the fire brick that I use. Just turn on the vacuum caster and switch it to the casting chamber. And looking at the furnace, all the silver is melted down to liquid, so it's ready to pour. And the reason why we're using vacuum is it will pull the metal down into the mold, filling it out perfectly. And any air will get sucked through the plaster, seeing that it's porous, but not porous enough for the metal to go through. After that, you just want to wait for the button to be solid and no longer glowing, and then you can pick it up with some tongs, because it's still extremely hot, and dunk it into a bucket of water. And make sure you completely submerge it. If you don't, it'll start splashing really hot water and investment everywhere. And just keep doing this until it stops sizzling. Normally this process will dissolve most of the investment, and your piece will fall out, but sometimes it gets stuck like this, which is fine, you can get it out still just using a flathead screwdriver, and it should be soft enough to just break away. And if you look through the top, you can see some of the skull rings. So let me clean this out real quick. And here it is all cleaned up. There is still some investment in the eyes and some smaller spots, but overall it looks like everything came out really good. And you might notice this metal is really clean. Normally you'd have to put this into a pickling solution, or technically an acid, to clean the oxidation off. The casting grain that I used happens to be an antioxidation blend, so it doesn't have any. So if you do this with silver and it comes out black, that's why. And to get the plaster out of the small areas, I'm going to use the ultrasonic cleaner, but you can also get it out with wire brushes. So now we need to cut these off the sprue tree, and I'm going to be using a size 5 saw blade, along with some blade butter as a lubricant, and this combination made really quick work of cutting these out. And you really want to use the biggest saw blade you can to get these off, seeing that it's a lot faster. There's also clippers that you can buy that will just snip these off, and then you clean them up. I just don't happen to have any. Cleanup of your parts is pretty straightforward. You just cut off the sprue as close as you possibly can to the piece, and then file it the rest of the way down. This is all going to make a lot of metal dust, and if you're working with precious metals, make sure you're saving all this, because it adds up really fast. And you're not limited to just hand tools for cleaning stuff up, like these heatless grinding wheels. And there's tons of different abrasives you can use to clean up your pieces or get the look you're going for. And this is where things are going to fall more on your personal preference and your own style, and how you like to finish things. I personally like to have a patina to a lot of my work, and to add it to these silver pieces, I'm going to use some libero sulfur in some very hot water, and probably leave them in there for about an hour. This is going to give them a nice dark gray finish. For the coin, I'm going to throw it into a tumbler for about four hours with some nice tumbling media to give it a unique look. 
And for the ring, I'm going to polish up all the high spots using a flex shaft and some polishing compound. Or if you have one, you can use a buffing polishing machine like this one and get this done really quick. And I highly suggest getting these finger guards if you're doing either one of the polishing, because the piece will get very hot as you're polishing it. And to clean off all the residue from the polishing, I'm just going to throw it in an ultrasonic cleaner. But you can also use hot soapy water and a toothbrush. And after all of that, here are the finished pieces. And these both came out looking really good in the different finishes. The coin having the patina with the rougher finish makes it look a lot older. It did have a little bit of an imperfection on the back, but with this finish, I think it looks fine. And then the skull ring with the high polish and dark and low spots for all the details make this really pop. And there's no real markings on this at all from the 3D print. And for being a heavy, solid silver ring, it is comfortable to wear. So that should be just about everything you need to know to get started casting. And I'm going to make sure to have links to everything you saw in this video in the description below, along with alternatives to each thing that come in at different price points. And if you have any questions, leave a comment on this video and I will try to get back to you as soon as I can to help you out. And if you want more in-depth videos like this one that get straight to the point about everything, subscribe to my channel. Well, that's about it, so I'll see you guys next time. Bye!